Okay, guys, this is Coach Scott. I'm going to go ahead and start recording because, well, nobody's here. That's fine. So this will be on streams. You can, uh, uh, a lot of folks in first and third period like to catch up and stay with it. And that's fine. This is the beauty of Teams is that we can record. We can go back. We can interact or not. So I'm recording this, and this will be in your streams. So um, let's go back over here, and I'm going to go ahead and open up our little uh, – in here teams open up our little powerpoint what i want to do today is really just start talking about um start really talking about uh, uh um electrochemistry and this is really sort of important because you're watching this on something right you're watching this on something I think I got the right window here, so I'm going to go here to screen three, screen one. All right. So let me pop up the Teams. Pop this open. All right. Then you should be seeing me. Go to the team and go to files, and we're going to pop open, and there it goes inside of there, our PowerPoint. So electrochemistry is, is a part of chemistry that deals with electrons and electricity. Submit. Have decided there. So let's start and start talking about electrochemistry. And they put my draw on so I can write on here if necessary. Go ahead and use a red pen. And then we can go back and forth. So um, we know we, we know from when we were studying about uh, different types of reaction when we put a metal in a solution that has got its own ions, we've got an equilibrium or reversible uh, reaction set up, right? So the metal, all right, will, those electrons will go into and become ionic, okay, and, and, and then they'll go back and forth. So um, if they lose electrons to become, become a cation, all right, They'll become the solid metal again. Then they'll go back to the cation again, and so on and so forth and so on. So some metals are more reactive than others, like magnesium. It's in the second column of the periodic table, all right? It loses its electrons pretty easily. So uh, this means that the reaction is more to the left rather than the solid, uh, the solid number. So a, num a, a bunch of electrons... Uh, get released, all right, and they'll collect on the surface of the metal, and that'll have a negative charge, negative charge, right? And this is where these things come from, right? So you've got other metals, like silver, that are not very reactive, all right? They really don't ionize very well. You'll see those in your transition metals for the most part. That, the equilibrium is going to go more to the right, all right? You're going to have fewer electrons will be on the metal, and it's going to be less negative. It's not going to be as negative, so it's going to have less charge. So um, it can develop actually a positive charge if the, uh, the, the aqueous ions will remove the electrons from the metal. Now, if you look at nonmetals, sometimes, like in hydrogen, right, hydrogen in water, will lose an electron and become a half a mole of hydrogen gas. We'll go back and forth. So this gives us a way to measure and to put how reactive some of these things in, how uh, many electrons or how negative it is, so and so forth. So uh, these are called potentials. So when you put an element in a solution that has its own ions, this will develop a charge on the metal. If it's in a non-metal, it'll be on the inert conductor that's in the solution. Okay, so the charge is called the electrode potential. The system is a half cell. We call it a half cell. So the sign and size of the charge will depend on the relative ability of the element to lose or gain electrons when it compares to the hydrogen half cell. They use hydrogen as a standard or a base, all right? So if it's greater than hydrogen, it's going to be a little different than in the less than hydrogen. So in order to make these comparisons, 
we've got to have, say, what are the standard conditions okay, when we're using the electrode potential of a given cell. So we call this the SERP or the standard electrode reduction potentials of that ab cell. So we'll say capital E with a little O on there, our SERP works too. So, uh, and it's measured relative to the standard hydrogen electrode. And it has a value, we call it 0, 0.00 volts. The standard conditions of 25C are 290K. Gases will have a pressure of one atmosphere and the solutions are one molar, right? So this is what we're talking about, all right? So let's look right here. So we've got hydrogen gas, and this is what we call the standard hydrogen electrode, all right? Uh, now there's a problem with using the, this as our standard electrode. It's difficult, difficult and very time consuming to set up this half cell. And it's very fragile and you can't move it. So you can't use it all the time. This is what it looks like. You've got a test tube where you've got hydrogen gas going in at one atmosphere. You'll usually have a platinum wire inside the test tube. All right. And you've got one mole of a molar of electrons at 298K. Now, this is a multimeter right there, right? That'll measure what the voltage potential is. And this is a metal or another half cell that we're testing. Now, there will be a salt bridge so these electrons can go back and forth. That's what makes this half cell set up. Now, we can measure this, right? Okay. And the more positive values, because all this is is a multimeter, is what if there's more positive then this half cell is going to gain more negative electrons if it's more negative then it's less likely to lose electrons so we can we've done these people have done these and they set these up in the table so anything above hydrogen okay tend to gain electrons so they're going to have a higher positive cert value and they're easily reduced. And this also makes them the best oxidizing agents. So uh, cobalt is a really good oxidizer, right? These are very these are very easily reduced because they've got a very high uh, positive SERP. Now, anything at the bottom of the electron really want to lose electrons. So they've got a negative. E prime value or CERT value, and these are easily oxidized. Remember, oxidation is loss of electrons, and these are the best reducing agents. So now we can actually figure this thing out. All right. So this is where it comes into. We're going to talk about something called a battery, like in my watch or on the computer if you're running a laptop or your iPad, or your Surface Pro, or whatever. So what is a battery? It's an electrochemical cell, just like this one, right? But it's used to generate electrical energy from a redox reaction. And we connect these two half cells, and they've got a different potential, all right? This creates a battery or an electrochemical cell that's going to produce electricity. So we can use a voltmeter or a multimeter or what have you that will actually measure the voltage, okay, coming across these cells. So it's not going to draw any current. It's not going to affect the reading. So we can do that, right? Some other things about batteries. So unlike the, uh, the voltmeters used to measure the voltage, that's what we just went over. I got to delete that one out. We'll go ahead and do it. There we go. So you've got a salt bridge, I mentioned this earlier, to connect the two half cells. Now this can be a filter paper, a piece of paper that's soaked in an ionic solution, usually you like potassium chloride or potassium nitride. Now this is a use the salt bridge, uh, the ionic solution in the bridge must not interfere with the two half cells. So <clears throat> we can't use KCL, all right, as the 
ionic salt bridge if one of them has got silver ions because silver is going to react with chlorine ions, which is part of that KCl, and it'll precipitate out in silver chloride. So that's going to decrease the, the concentration of the silver ions in the solution. It's going to affect the battery or the cell. So what the salt bridge does is it allows the ions, ions, not the electrons, to transfer between those two solutions. And this will complete the circuit. Now ions are going to flow in order. Why do they flow? They flow to balance the charge. So this is, a, this is an example of what a battery is. So the electrons are going to flow through the wire toward the more positive half cell. Okay, in this case, so your electrons, let me get my little things going. The electrons are going to go this way. Well, oh, I had my pen thing. All right, so there's my pen. Electrons are going to go this way. Do that. Toward the copper electrode. All right, away from the zinc. So the copper ions are going to gain electrons, and they're going to be reduced. All right. So we can write a cell diagram, something like this. So you've got copper ions in solution. You've got that copper electrode. So this is where the cell is. This is the, uh, the uh, solid, if you would. And this is the ionic solution, right? And that's what it means. This is just how you write cell diagrams. That's a half cell, and that's a half cell. Two lines makes it a whole cell. Now, zinc ions are produced in this half cell. So there's going to be a buildup of positive charge. Now, the ions are going to move across this bridge. That's what completes the circuit. So the electrons go toward the positive electrode, okay, and that, like so. So what this does is this, uh, the charges are going to build up here. There's going to be a buildup of positive charges. They're going to move across that way and to go here into the negative charges. The ions will go this way, and that produces, and that completes the circuit. Now, this is balanced by negative ions, that are going to migrate across the salt bridge into the zinc half cell. So this is huge. You're not going to be tested on it or anything. So that's what a battery is. Your phone battery. It's got two, uh, two uh, different components with different reduction potentials. And you put them together and you put a bridge in between them. And it moves those electrons back and forth. So the standard diagrams, let's talk about this and we'll be done. So the reduced species is always on the right-hand side. We call it the cathode because the cations are developed. The oxidation species or the oxidized species is on the left-hand side. We call that the anode. So the right-hand side and the left-hand side, that's MB stands for notabene, applies to the cell diagram, not necessarily to the drawing. If you see the drawing and it doesn't have what's going on, you shouldn't be asked to identify the cathode or the anode, but it helps to know what you're talking about. So the vertical line represents the different phases in each electrode. Okay, so we talked about that a little bit earlier in this slide. That's what the, uh, the one vertical line means. The double line represents the salt bridge that connects the two electrodes. Now we use different species that are in the same phase. We separate by a column, okay? This doesn't usually happen. If I've got iron one and iron three in there, they've got to separate them with a comma. So when I've got an inert conductor like the hydrogen, the platinum electrode, okay? when no solid metal is present, we can also put that inside parentheses. So at the very bottom of the page, if you look at the hydrogen cell, that's oxidized. 
So I put the platinum in parentheses to show it's more like a, and it was an inert conductor. All right. And that's with the half uh, mole of hydrogen gas. All right. That's one side of that half cell. The other side where the vertical line is, is the hydrogen ions, aqueous solutions. If it's reduced, right, then I'll put it like the exact opposite. So those are what a battery is, and those are battery diagrams. So also in your team, and we'll start this, right? Y'all can look through this. I've got a couple of TED Talks, and I'm going to play them now. All right. All right. This is a really good TED Talk, and I think you can hear them. All right. We're going to talk you know, some questions. The electricity powering the lights in this theater was generated just moments ago. This is Donald Sedaway. The way things He's a stand uh, today, professor of chemical engineering at MIT. Electricity demand must be in constant balance with electricity supply. If in the time that it took me to walk out here on this stage, some tens of megawatts of wind power stopped pouring into the grid, the difference would have to be made up from other generators immediately. But Coal plants, nuclear plants can't respond fast enough. A giant battery could. With a giant battery, we'd be able to address the problem of intermittency that prevents wind and solar from contributing to the grid in the same way that coal and gas and nuclear do today. You see, the battery is the key enabling device here. With it, we could draw electricity from the sun even when the sun doesn't shine. And that changes everything, because then renewables such as wind and solar come out from the wings here to center stage. Today, I want to tell you about such a device. It's called the liquid metal battery. It's a new form of energy storage that I invented at MIT, along with a team of my students and postdocs. Now, the theme of this year's TED conference is full spectrum. The OED defines spectrum as the entire range of wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation from the longest radio waves to the shortest gamma rays of which the range of visible light is only a small part so i'm not here today only to tell you how my team at mit has drawn out of nature a solution to one of the world's great problems i want to go full spectrum and tell you how in the process of developing this new technology We've uncovered some surprising heterodoxies that can serve as lessons for innovation. Ideas worth spreading. And you know, if we're going to get this country out of its current energy situation, we can't just conserve our way out. We can't just drill our way out. We can't bomb our way out. We're going to do it the old-fashioned American way. We're going to invent our way out working together. Now let's get started. The battery was invented about 200 years ago by a professor, Alessandro Volta, at the University of Padua in Italy. His invention gave birth to a new field of science, electrochemistry, and new technologies such as electroplating. Perhaps overlooked, Volta's invention of the battery for the first time also demonstrated the utility of a professor. Until Volta, nobody could imagine a professor could be of any use. Here's the first battery. A stack of coins, zinc, silver, separated by cardboard soaked in brine. This is the starting point for designing a battery. Two electrodes, in this case metals of different composition, and an electrolyte, in this case salt dissolved in water. The science is that simple. Admittedly, I've left out a few details. Now, I've taught you that battery science is straightforward and the need for grid level storage is compelling. But the fact is that today there is simply no battery technology capable of meeting the demanding performance requirements of the grid, namely uncommonly high power, long service lifetime, and super low cost. We need to think about the problem differently. We need to think big, we need to think cheap. So let's abandon the paradigm of 
let's search for the coolest chemistry and then hopefully we'll chase down the cost curve by just making lots and lots of product. Instead, let's invent to the price point of the electricity market. So that means that certain parts of the periodic table are axiomatically off limits. This battery needs to be made out of earth abundant elements. I say if you want to make something dirt cheap, make it out of dirt. Preferably dirt that's locally sourced. And we need to be able to build this thing using simple manufacturing techniques and factories that don't cost us a fortune. So about six years ago, I started thinking about this problem. And in order to adopt a fresh perspective, I sought inspiration from beyond the field of electricity storage. In fact, I looked to a technology that neither stores nor generates electricity, but instead consumes electricity, huge amounts of it. I'm talking about the production of aluminum. The process was invented in 1886 by a couple of 22 year olds, Hall in the United States and he rule in France. In just a few short years following their discovery, aluminum changed from a precious metal costing as much as silver to a common structural material. You're looking at the cell house of a modern aluminum smelter. It's about 50 feet wide and recedes about a half a mile. Row after row of cells that inside resemble Volta's battery with three important differences. Volta's battery works at room temperature. It's fitted with solid electrodes and an electrolyte that's a solution of salt and water. The hall he rule cell operates at high temperature a temperature high enough that the aluminum metal product is liquid. The electrolyte is not a solution of salt and water, but rather salt that's melted. It's this combination of liquid metal, molten salt, and high temperature that allows us to send high current through this thing. Today, we can produce virgin metal from ore at a cost of less than 50 cents a pound. That's the economic miracle of modern electrometallurgy. It is this that caught and held my attention to the point that I became obsessed with inventing a battery that could capture this gigantic economy of scale. And I did. I made the battery all liquid, liquid metals for both electrodes and a molten salt for the electrolyte. I'll show you how. So I put low density liquid metal at the top, put a high density liquid metal at the bottom, and molten salt in between. There's your salt bridge. So now, how to choose the metals? For me, the design exercise always begins here with the periodic table enunciated by another professor, Dmitry Mendeleev. Everything we know is made of some combination of what you see depicted here, and that includes our own bodies. I recall the very moment one day when I was searching for a pair of metals that would meet the constraints of earth abundance, different opposite density, and high mutual reactivity, I felt the thrill of realization when I knew I'd come upon the answer. Magnesium to the top layer and antimony to the bottom layer. You know, I gotta tell you, one of the greatest benefits of being a professor, colored chalk. <laughs> so to produce current, Magnesium loses two electrons to become magnesium ion, which then migrates across the electrolyte, accepts two electrons from the antimony, and then mixes with it to form an alloy. The electrons go to work in the real world out here, powering our devices. Now, to charge the battery, we connect a source of electricity. 
could be something like a wind farm. And then we reverse the current. And this forces magnesium to de-alloy and return to the upper electrode, restoring the initial constitution of the battery. And the current passing between the electrodes generates enough heat to keep it at temperature. Pretty cool, at least in theory. So again, that's really just work. like that cell so what to we do have next? on our diagram. We go to the laboratory. Now, do I hire seasoned professionals? No. I hire a student and mentor him, teach him how to think about the problem, to see it from my perspective, and then turn him loose. This is that student, David Bradwell, who in this image appears to be wondering if this thing will ever work. What I didn't tell David at the time was I myself wasn't convinced it would work. But David's young, he's smart, he wants a PhD, and he proceeds to build. He proceeds to build the first ever liquid metal battery of this chemistry. And based on David's initial promising results, which were paid with funds, seed funds at MIT, I was able to track major research funding from the private sector and the federal government. And that allowed me to expand my group to 20 people, a mix of graduate students, postdocs, and even some undergraduates. And I was able to attract really, really good people, people who share my passion for science and service to society, not science and service for career building. And if you ask these people why they work on liquid metal battery, their answer would harken back to President Kennedy's remarks at Rice University in 1962 when he said, and I'm taking liberties here, we choose to work on grid level storage, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. So this is the evolution of the liquid metal battery. We start here with our workhorse one watt hour cell. I called it the shot glass. We've operated over 400 of these, perfecting their performance with a plurality of chemistries, not just magnesium antimony. Along the way, we scaled up to the 20 watt hour cell. I call it the hockey puck. And we got the same remarkable results. And then it was on to the saucer. That's 200 watt hours. The technology was proving itself to be robust and scalable. But the pace wasn't fast enough for us. So a year and a half ago, David and I, along with another research staff member, formed a company to accelerate the rate of progress and the race to manufacture product. So today at LMBC, we're building cells 16 inches in diameter with a capacity of one kilowatt hour, 1,000 times the capacity of that initial shot glass cell. We call that the pizza. And then we've got a four kilowatt hour cell on the horizon. It's gonna be 36 inches in diameter. We call that the bistro table, but it's not ready yet for prime time viewing. And one variant of the technology has us stacking these bistro table tops into modules, aggregating the modules into a giant battery that fits into a 40 foot shipping container for placement in the field. And this has a nameplate capacity of two megawatt hours, two million watt hours. That's enough energy to meet the daily electrical needs of 200 American households. So here you have it, grid level storage, silent, emissions free, no moving parts, remotely controlled, designed to the market price point without subsidy. So what have we learned from all this? So what have we learned from all this? Let me share with you some of the surprises, the heterodoxies. They lie beyond the visible. Temperature. Conventional wisdom says set it low, at or near room temperature, and then install a control system to keep it there. Avoid thermal runaway. Liquid metal battery is designed to operate at elevated temperature with minimum regulation. Our battery can handle the very high temperature rises that come from current surges. Scaling. Conventional wisdom says reduce costs by producing many. Liquid metal battery is designed to reduce costs by producing fewer, but they'll be larger. 
and finally human resources. Conventional wisdom says hire battery experts, seasoned professionals who can draw upon their vast experience and knowledge to develop liquid metal battery. I hired students and postdocs and mentored them. In a battery, I strive to maximize electrical potential. When mentoring, I strive to maximize human potential. So you see, the liquid metal battery story is more than an account of inventing technology. It's a blueprint for inventing inventors. Full spectrum. Okay, so there was a lot of cool things in there uh, that's relevant to what we're talking about with the with the, the part of electrochemistry we covered today. There's another TED Talk I want you guys to be looking at. It's on growing batteries from nature. I think you'll enjoy that. Professor uh, Sidaway, he uh, also teaches on MIT Online, the free stuff. And uh, he does a really good electro, uh, uh, chemistry lectures for engineers. So <clears throat> pretty good dude. Uh, but his liquid, liquid metal battery concept, you could draw those cell diagrams using the antimony and the magnesium, readily available uh, materials you can find everywhere. So, um, yeah, pretty neat. So this is a good way to hold energy that we can create through wind tunnels or solar or what have you. So, again, something that's very pertinent to what we're doing. So, let me go back in here. All right, and I'm going to turn off my screen. So, we can do that. All right. So, again, um, hopefully see you guys on Wednesday. I think I've got it set up for 3.30, whatever i got it set up for. And we're going to go over uh, a galvanic cell, which is a little different than a battery. All right. And then we'll be done with electrochemistry. What we want to be doing uh, next next week, we'll cover nuclear chemistry, cross section or two. And then we'll get into some uh, organic chemistry. Uh, I should be filming some videos and doing some experiments. And uh, also, I'm going to post a video experiment like I did this week uh, for the, I think it was equilibrium or thermochemistry. I'm going to uh, post an electrochemistry uh, and a link if you want to see it live on flynnsci.com. And uh, they're doing an electrochemistry experiment this week. So that should be fine. Okay, so guys, this is Coach Scott. Sorry, y'all couldn't join today, but hopefully we'll see you on the next go around. So y'all be safe. Stay inside, or away from people, and uh, we'll get through this next month. Talk to you later. Bye.